It was the February 28th, uh, February 28th, 2023 edition of Time magazine that recently caught my attention. It dedicated multiple pages to analysing the Ashby revival. Now, I've shared with you about the reality of the Ashby revival from the religious press just once or twice uh, in, our, in our church. It has been a feature of the religious press for weeks. Now, it's the secular media's turn. The Ashby revival occurred at Ashby University. This is what uh, Time magazine has got to uh, say about the Ashby revival. Something happened at Ashby University. Many Christians called it the weeks-long worship service at, at the Kentucky School, which attracted tens of thousands of uh, people and disrupted campus life, a revival. Fervent worship and prayer began during a February 8, 2023, chapel service and continued for hours, then days, then weeks afterwards, day and night for almost two solid weeks, the Ashby revival continued at the university chapel. In the end, they had to close it down because there were so many people coming into the town from uh, surrounding districts. Ashby administrators, noting that the school and town had been overwhelmed by the rush of outside visitors, officially ended the on-campus revival gatherings just last week. But a number of other universities have reported their own enthusiastic campus awakenings leading to excited Christians to contend that this is an evidence of an unprecedented movement of God across the nation. It's February this year. The revival has had its fair share of sceptics, however, many of whom argue that this is just another instance of an embarrassing evangelical behaviour. Two general critical tens have emerged each of which has roots in long traditions of revivalist reproval. The first worries that revivals like Ashbury's lack moral seriousness. The second concern is that revivals like Ashbury's are simply sites of emotional manipulation, that participants are being swept up in the char charisma that is artificial, designed to induce chill bumps on arm-type responses. If a revival is simply the powerful surge of, an emo of a collective emotion or the product of stagecraft, is it a real revival? Time magazine, they dedicate page after page to it. It's a good question. Do spiritual revivals just happen? Or if you like, to put it another way, are there conditions that need to be met before God's blessing can be expected? Which is it? Is it possible to receive an outpouring of the Spirit by simply playing 15, 15 stanzas of Just As I Am. Is that possible? Well, actually, you can actually get people to respond by singing, by playing the right music. Thankfully, I can't play and I can't sing. Therefore, you're going to have to let me share. Last week, our first sermon was entitled, Christ in You. In that study, we looked at the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. We asked, is it possible for the believer to be a victorious Christian? We looked at 
a possible biblical response. You recall that what we looked at was that according to Scripture, a Christ in you through the Holy Spirit was in fact the hope of glory. If we deny that Christ cannot change us on the inside, we are actually denying the work of the Holy Spirit. This week, in our second sermon, I've entitled it More Than You Could Possibly Ask or Think. In this study, we continue by looking at the work of the Spirit in the life of the individual, but I want to go a step further. I want us to ask, are there conditions for the empowerment of the Spirit? Are there conditions? You see, my friends, one of the things I'm so conscious of is that whenever the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is spoken of, what so, so often happens is that if it's a genuine outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it only lasts a very brief time before the plant dies. It's like that seed being put into the field. The roots go down, but there's, there's no depth uh, to, the, uh, to the soil and therefore the plant dies, according to, the, uh, according to the word of God. In a genuine revival, we want the roots to go down deep. We want them to go down deep so that something grows up, a plant grows up and bears much fruit. The other danger, of course, is that an outpouring may not actually be genuine. I want to suggest to you, those twin dangers are addressed by considering these conditions. That question, that question is so important. Are there conditions for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? My friends, I want to suggest to you today that there are. I want to suggest to you that they are very clear within the word of God. I want to suggest to you that if in fact we ignore them, the plant, even in a genuine revival, will die. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you right now because I want to say thank you for being the almighty God. Lord, thank you for being the creator. Thank you for being the redeemer. Thank you for giving us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, thank you for giving us the word of God. Thank you for giving us exceedingly great and precious promises. Lord, I just pray that as we dig into your word today, that indeed we'll come to an understanding of, uh, of this subject, that indeed the Holy Spirit might be poured out in our lives, but in a consistent and regular fashion. It might not be something that is just passing. Lord, these things we ask. We pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. We're living in incredibly unique times. The world is in agitation. The gospel in early New Testament times, according to the book of Acts, turned the world what? Upside down. It turned the world upside down is what the gospel did in those early New Testament days. Right now, the gospel is being pushed to the periphery of our world. Do you agree? It's being pushed to the periphery of our world. Even in the lives of Christians, can I suggest you suggest to you that the gospel is slowly being pushed, even in the lives of Christians, to the periphery, to so many Christians. The danger is that the same thing occurs within our lives. In its place today, we're seeing a form of religion that is increasingly secular and is politically driven. That's what we're seeing in its place. Do you understand why the Apostle Paul, living in a polytheistic and an anti-Christian world, call on believers to live a radical form of life? 
Come with me in your Bible, if you will, to uh, uh, Romans chapter 13. And let's just see what Paul uh, says about the life that he desires, that he sees people in his world, in that polytheistic, in that anti-Christian world of the first century, that he sees those Christian people uh, living. Uh, First Corinthians, uh, sorry, Romans, uh, chapter uh, chapter 13, and it's verse uh, 11 uh, down to... uh, Uh, down to 14 and uh, this is what Paul says and do this knowing the time that it is now high time to awake out of what oh wait a moment in Paul's day the polytheistic world where there's many gods he says hey to that congregation he says it's time for them to wake out of were they asleep First century? My friends, if Paul could say it in the first century, how much truer is it today? Do this knowing the time that it's now high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and in drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, and not in strife and envy, but put on who? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision to fulfil the lusts of the flesh. My friends, what does it mean? To make no provision to fulfil the lusts of the flesh. Is it possible for even Christian people to somehow keep something in reserve so that just perhaps, maybe perhaps, there's, they're making provision for the works of the flesh? Last week, we called the sermon Christ in You. We proposed that having the Holy Spirit in us was the same as having Christ in us. When the Holy Spirit is in me, according to what we learnt last week, who is in me? Jesus Christ. Do you want Christ in you? Christ in you is the hope of who? He is the hope of glory. My friends, if we do not have Jesus Christ in us, according to um, John and and Nicodemus, John chapter 3, if Christ is not on us, what's our condition as far as salvation is concerned? You are lost. Unless you be born of water and the what? Spirit. You shall not see the kingdom of God. My friends... (laughs) This having the Holy Spirit in us is the same as having Christ in us. This is the desire for the Word of God. But are there conditions for the Spirit to connect himself to me? Now, this is where it's important to realise that even in a genuine revival, it's possible for a plant to start to grow, according to one of Christ's parables, but then to wither and die. Are you aware of that? That's a genuine revival. These conditions, when they are put in place, I'll suggest to you, actually cut through that possibility. They actually allow a plant to grow from the beginning and keep on growing. You see, one of the real problems I suggest to you about the Ashby revival is that many people may well have taken a genuine stand for Jesus Christ because there was confession of sin. They came down the aisle. They came to the front. They they were prayed for. They prayed themselves. They accepted Jesus Christ. The problem is... They packed up and went home. 
They called it the mountaintop experience. What comes after the mountaintop experience? The what? The valley comes after the mountaintop experience. They go home. The conditions are not followed and the valley appears. Is it possible for us to be able to walk on the mountaintop with Jesus Christ? I suggest. I suggest it is. Okay, let's look at these conditions. We're going to have to move very quickly on this one. Come to uh, Acts, chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to take you through. This is a little bit of a Bible study. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse uh, 37 and 38. This is Peter. He's standing up on the day of Pentecost. He's preaching his, his mighty Pentecostal uh, sermon. Peter is the man who has to preach. And uh, verse 37, Acts chapter 2 says this. And Peter said to them, he's now right at the very end of his sermon. Peter says to them, repent and let every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the what? What did he say the people had to do in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Repent. Repent. My friends, I suggest to you, the very, the very first expectation if a person is going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, is that they do what? They repent. They repent. The call to hearers on the day of Pentecost was to repent of a thing called sin. According to Peter, no repentance equals no Holy Spirit. Now, just stay with me on this one, folks, because this is really important where we're going to go to now. We live in an era right now where sin barely exists. Does it? We live in a world now where sin barely exists. Preachers are not allowed to talk about it. And if you mention it in the government circles, you will be derided. Sin barely exists. Now, Stay with me. That's the era we're living in. If there is no sin, there can be no what? Repentance. repentance. If there is no sin, there can be no repentance. If there is no repentance, there can be what? No, there can be no Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to those who what? Who repent. If in fact... There it can be no repentance. There is no Holy Spirit. There's no Holy Spirit. There's no salvation. Do you see the deplorable situation our world is in today? Do you understand why it appears that the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn from this world. You know, the more I look at my world today, the more I turn around and say, I believe from all that's occurring in this world that the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn from this world. Is this God's will that it be withdrawn? No, it's not God's will that it be withdrawn. But what's occurring? Well, humanity is just simply saying there is no sin. If there is no sin, there is no repentance. If there is no repentance... There's no possibility of the Holy Spirit. So who's functioning in everybody's life? You see what Peter says on the day of Pentecost. Repent and let every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. What's repentance? What is repentance? My friends, probably the best example I know is found in Psalm 51. Come with me into Psalm 51. You know it well. You know, have you ever written a prayer? Have you ever done that? You know, I well imagine this is actually a prayer. This Psalm 51 is a prayer written by who? King David is writing... What is his experience that causes him to write this prayer? 
What's he done? Come back to me. Adultery. He's jumped into bed with Bathsheba. He's murdered a man. The prophet has come to him. He's tried to hide his sin. The prophet has come to him and says, you are the man, you are guilty. David puts up his hand. He goes into his room. He takes out his quill and he starts to write. He writes his prayer. What does he write? Listen to this. This is David in his repentance prayer after adultery. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my... Is this repentance? For I acknowledge my word and my sin is always before me. Go to verse 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Do you hear David in tears? He deals with sin. As I read this, I look at this and I just simply say, hey, David is dealing with sin as sin needs to be dealt with. He needs to be dealt with. But you know something else? King David wrote so much of his personal experience in his own devotional time. He wrote his prayers down. This is powerful because we've still got them today. Many of the things we call psalms are David's prayers. David has a deep and a a wonderful understanding of this thing called sin. Come to Psalm 19 because he says something else that I think is, to to me, so relevant to to us today. Now, we're going to come back to Psalm 19 a little bit later, but I just want you to look at um, verse 12 and 13. This is is what King David, he's, he's now writing his prayer again. He says this, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me, O God, from secret what? From secret, what are secret faults? Sins that you don't see, sins that nobody else knows about. Cleanse me, O God, from sins that nobody else knows about. Keep back, now look at verse 13. Keep back your servant also from what? What is it? Presumptuous sin. What is a what is presumptuous sin? It's when you think God won't have a problem with that. It's when you presume on his grace. You say, for by grace am I saved, through faith. That not in myself, it's the gift of God. And I then presume on his grace... To sin against him. Now, my friends, only the Holy Spirit can convict you right now. But I'm conscious the Holy Spirit has that ability to convict you. Do you see what this is saying? Keep back your servant also from presumptuous, from presuming on your grace. Wow. David is starting to understand something about this subject of sin. How dangerous it really is. How much it impacts us. How good we are at being able to justify that which is evil. 
But let's keep moving. Are there other? You see, folks, what we want to do is we want to look at this subject and say, hey, how can we have revival that actually goes deep and we don't just have a one-day wonder? In order to have it go deep, you have to obey the conditions. Obey the conditions and you don't get a one-day wonder. I am frightened, frightened, frightened when I see the number of times I see revival in history having broken out, breaks out for a day or two and then goes away. Galatians chapter 3. Let's have a look at another of the... And there's enough in this, by the way, folks, to, to go for an entire... another series. Galatians chapter 3, and it's verse 13 down to 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Through what? Through faith. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You see, the first expectation in Scripture for the outpouring of the filling of the Holy Spirit is this issue of repentance. But we receive the Spirit through faith. Why is that important? It's important because there are many who look for evidence of some supernatural gift as proof they've been given the Holy Spirit. Faith does not require a supernatural gift. Within the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit is present, the evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life is what? Change character. In the New Testament, it's called fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. That's the fruit. By the way, fruit only develops on a mature tree. Sometimes it takes time. That's the evidence of the moving of the Holy Spirit. Yes, he may give a supernatural gift to some people as well, but he gives it as he will to individuals. Faith. The conditions for the Spirit. Number one, repentance. Number two, faith. Number three, Luke chapter 11. Come with me to, to Luke uh, chapter, chapter 11. And it's verse uh, 9 and 10. And then we're going to go to verse 13. Christ has just been teaching his disciples and he uses the example of the Lord's Prayer. He says this, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will what? Find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. To him who knocks it will be opened. Verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who what? Ask him. him. To those who ask him. Thank you, Josh. To those who ask him. Love that. The Holy Spirit apparently comes because of what? Prayer. 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 But do you know what is spoken about here isn't just one prayer. This is talking about persistent prayer. This is the sort of request that your children know so well. Mums and dads, your young people are at the shop. They see something that particularly appeals to them. Mom. Uh, no, no, not, not today. 
Mom? Well, no, no, not, not today. Go away. Mom? My friends, this is the sort of persistence that our children know about. But we seem to have forgotten. Do you know the story, what Christ does when he teaches his disciples uh, here in, in this passage in, uh, in Luke chapter, uh, chapter 11. He, he, the verses I left out say this. If a son asks for bread, will any father amongst you give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead? If he asks for an egg, will he offer him a, scor- a scorpion? He uses the example of childhood. Can I make a suggestion to you? You know, my friends, I'm so conscious that it's only by praying that we actually learn to pray. Something I've discovered is this, is that as you pray, your prayers become wider, deeper, and far less selfish. But it only happens as you pray. One of the things I'm so conscious about is it's so easy when we want to have the blessing of the Holy Spirit to pray, Lord, give me the Holy Spirit. And you know, sometimes the Lord God is very generous. He says, you have asked, I will give. But just like the little shoot that's just starting up, we pack up and we go home. We've had the mountaintop experience. We stop praying and guess what happens? It's no more. Let me just read you. I, I love this, uh, this particular book. It's called Steps to Christ. My friends, I, if there's one book I'd challenge you to read, it's this one. Read it, reread it, and keep on reading it. Page uh, 95 says this. The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. Did you get that? The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. Now, if in fact I don't pray day after day after day after day, what's going to enclose me? The whispered temptations of the enemy entice them to sin and it's all because they do not make use of the privileges that God has given them in the divine appointment with prayer. Did you get that? When I read that, I thought, I thought wow, this is, this is so huge. The whispered temptations of the enemy entice them to sin and it's all because they have not made use of their privileges that God has given them in the divine appointment to prayer. You've sinned. You've said, Lord, please forgive me for my sin. But what has been your initial sin? What's been your initial sin? Neglect of prayer. The greater sin is not the action that you have done. The greater sin is you have not prayed. Why should the sons and daughters of God be reluctant to pray when prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse? Can you imagine it? We say to one of our children, children, here is the bank card. You can have whatever you like on the bank card. And then we, our children say, oh, thanks, Dad. They put it in their pocket, pack up. Go home. I wish my father had said something like that to me. In my day, it certainly wouldn't have sat in my pocket. And yet we've got the Lord God. The Almighty God says to us, I give you, I give you something that I want to give you. I want to give you heaven's blessings. You don't ask them. You don't, you don't draw down on the check. A couple of pages later, she carries on. Although there may be a tainted, corrupted atmosphere around us, we need not breathe its miasma. But we may live in the pure air of heaven 
we may close the door to impure imaginings and the unholy thoughts by lifting the soul into the presence of God through sincere prayer. Those whose hearts are open to receive the support and blessing of God will walk in a holier atmosphere than that of earth and they will have constant communion with the God of heaven. My friends, I'll make a suggestion to you. Our biggest challenge in the day and age in which we're living today is actually the sin of refusing to pray. What are the conditions for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that the seed both takes root and grows. It's repentance, faith, persistent prayer. But then there's something else. I just ask that you come to Acts chapter 5, verse 32. Acts 5, 32. And this is, uh, again, this is uh, Peter and John. Acts 5, verse, uh, uh, verse 32. And uh, this is uh, the apostles, uh, James and Peter and John, I think it is, is are on trial once again. Uh, Acts uh, 5, 32, they're now before the Sanhedrin, they're being judged. Uh, 5, 32 says this. And we are the witnesses to these things, which they've just listed off, And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those that what? Give the Holy Spirit to them who what? Come to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And this is verse... uh, Verse 20, 23. 14 and verse 23. This is so powerful. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine but the Father's who sent me. Notice that verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my what? He will keep my word and my Father will love him and we, who's we? The Father and who? The Son, through the Spirit, uh, will come and... uh, Whereabouts are we? Sorry. Um, um, Will come to him and make our home with him. My friends, do you want God himself to make his home within your heart? No, my friends, that's my, that's what I want. That's what I want. It's so powerful. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. But pastor, isn't that legalism? Obeying the, uh, obeying the word of scripture, isn't that legalism? Come back to me, if, come back with me, if you will, to Psalm 19. This uh, King David has got so much. I wish I could sit with King David in his study. I wish I could look over his shoulder. I, I wish I could just uh, listen to David's prayers. But I'm just so thankful that he actually wrote them, wrote them all, all down. Uh, Psalm 19, and he's talking about his attitude. He's actually praying thanks for the law of God. Just listen to this. Uh, uh, Psalm 19, verse 7, down to verse 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the what? Do you want just 
Do you want your heart to be changed? King David is saying that you understand the law of God, you can do that. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom after all. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Then he comes this. More to be desired are they than what? Gold. More to be desired than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great, there is huge, there is fantastic reward. My friends, does this sound much like legalism? You know, to me, as I look at this, I turn around and say, hey, how can something that I've learned to love be legalism? There is no legalism in this. When the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world. You see, this issue of obedience, I suggest to you, in the world today, is part of having that plant grow. If, in fact, I am unprepared to repent, if I'm unprepared to exercise faith, if I'm unprepared to pray, if I'm unprepared to be obedient, ultimately the plant that may start so well will die. Is that reasonable? In our world today, do you understand why in our world today This issue of how do I regard my body is becoming so key. In the scriptures, and this will be one of my last passages, I promise I will sit down. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter chapter 6 and verse, uh, verse 19. Do you understand why Paul can write this? Do you not know that your body is the temple of what? The Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. Your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Why can Paul write that? Why can he say the same thing just a few, a few chapters earlier in chapter, in chapter 3? He can say it because once I've asked the Holy Spirit into my life, I've got the indwelling of Jesus Christ. Therefore, you are not your own. Our world today says, my body, my choice. As a Christian, you cannot say that. Because your body is not your body. Your body is the temple of of the Holy Spirit. You are responsible to the Lord God for that. God says he created the male and female. Man says there are as many genders as you want. Allow the Holy Spirit to take that where it needs to go. My friends, today... This is the second, the four sermon series that's looking at the role and the function of the Holy Spirit. You see, my friends, not only do I want to see, not only do I plead, not only does the scriptures want to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that results in growth, germination of the seed that will take a person heavenward, the expectation in scripture is that that uh, that plant will grow, it will bud until finally it bears fruit. That's the expectation in the word of God. But the conditions... uh, moving against the conditions that are based in Scripture can allow that plant to die 
at any point. Today we're looking, this is the second in the four sermon series, it's looking at the role and function of the Holy Spirit as we see the closing events of earth's history unfolding before us. My friends, I said it last week and I say it to you again. The train is rolling. I believe we are witnessing right now the closing events opening up before us right now. It's easy to speak of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church but it's so easy to ignore the starting point and that's the impact of the Holy Spirit on the life of the believer. In times past, the outpouring of the Spirit has seen much prayer and wonderful reformation. It started in the heart of the individual. So easy to assume that God is going to do a work for us that has actually been given to us. I suggest to you, God has in fact given a work for humanity to do. That's a work in my life, in your life, in our lives. May the Lord richly bless you.